I wanted to um, introduce our next speaker, uh, but first I also wanted to uh, thank our volunteers who are helping out today. Um, Steve was welcoming people uh, up, a, up front so they could find their way here, even though some people found a back staircase. I don't know how they got in. <laughs> um, and, and Michael is helping um, with the live stream and the social media during, this, uh, during the seminar. So thank you for doing that. Um, our, our volunteers are from the Los Angeles support group, and we meet once a month on the second Sunday of the month at 2 o'clock. We meet, um, actually there's a lot of people that come to our meeting that are here today, so it's nice to see some friendly faces. Um, anyways, so you're welcome to join us. It's, as I said, the second Sunday of the month at the SAA offices. So we're a national organization, but our, our, our offices are located right here in the San Fernando Valley in Van Nuys by the Van Nuys Airport. So um, you're welcome to join us there. And it's on our website, stopas.org. All right, so our next speaker, I'm happy to welcome, Sturdy McKee. Sturdy McKee is a physical therapist who has been living with ankylosing spondylitis for over 20 years. He is a co-founder of San Francisco Sport and Spine Physical Therapy, ScheduleDoc.co, and SleepSlingCo.co. Sturdy is on the editorial board of Impact Magazine, a private practice section of the American Physical Therapy Association. So please help me welcome Sturdy. So uh, I want to thank everybody at SA for having me. It's been a few years um, since I've done a talk for them. But uh, the good news is the human body hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, mine has a little bit, but that's a different story. And also thanks to Elaine for uh, doing this before lunch. I like the before lunch slot, even though we do get you moving a little bit, because later on, you know, at that two o'clock slot, man, that's like <laughs> he's out there. <clears throat> yeah, I'll be back on an airplane um, <laughs> and sleeping probably. Okay, so this is the spine. We're going to go through some anatomy, some exercises, some general, um, and actually get into s more than just general anatomy, but some of the nitty gritty, the how tos, what fors, and all. Um, I learned to orient everybody to the spine because uh, a number of years ago, I just kind of assumed people knew and we had a model out and I'm showing you know, patients what to do. This is the front, this is the back, that's the left side, so that's the front, that's the back. Um, the reason that's important is we're gonna talk about the neural frame and the openings uh, in here. That's where the nerves exit. And I had a gentleman who had stenosis and stenosis is just fancy for narrowing. Um, you know, because the doctors and all, they don't want you to know what they mean when they're talking about it. So stenosis is narrowing, uh, and have foramenal stenosis, so those uh, openings where the nerve roots exit. And we went through, talked about it, showed him the model, um, did the exercises. He went home, he came back a few days later, he said, everything you've given me is, is making my symptoms worse and it's horrible. I'm like, really? Okay, so would you please show me? what you're doing, he was doing everything exactly opposite. Everything. I mean, we, every, you know, stenosis, the whole idea, we'll go into this, is forward, you do forward bending because this way we'll clamp down. So of course he was doing everything back this way and just hammering on the nerves, and yeah, he was worse. Um, so we have to, you know, lay the context and the groundwork here. The other thing you'll learn is, uh, again, aside from the cervical or cervical in Australia, and thoracic, lumbar, the sacrum, and then the pelvis. This is the axial skeleton. And when you're talking to physicians, particularly, or PTs, but more physician surgeon, when they start naming segments, um, what they're talking about is the intersection between two vertebrae. So if they're talking about C5, 6, they're talking about cervical, count from the top down, 5 and 6. And we'll look at some of those articulations later, too. But that's important, too, because the nerve roots exit below. And of course, this is the part that's fun. They exit below the level down here. So if you're talking about a T12 nerve root, it exits below T12. And the cervical spine, it's above because there's one above between the brain and C1. And then there's, so there's C1 through 8 for the nerves. Did I just lose everybody? No. Okay. <laughs> so um, there's one that exits above the first cerv cervical vertebrae. So instead of calling that like the skull one or whatever, it's C1. And then they go C1 through 8. So when somebody refers to a C8 nerve root, no, they didn't make it up. There is a C8, even though there is not not a C8 vertebrae. Okay? All right. So the skeleton, the important thing about the skeleton is its, it's design. Um, you know, basically, it's our framework. It keeps us up. 
against gravity, right? If we didn't have one, we'd look like the guy on the right. Um, you know, who, very pretty in the water, right? But don't take them out. Um, but we've got that, you know, it's the framework against which our muscles move and pull and keep us upright and keep our, all our organs protected and functioning and the casing too for the brain, right? Um, but there's some significant differences here. If you go back to think about that, that side view of the spine, there's some curves there, right? And that came about because we're vertical, we're upright, we're bipeds. So if you look at, uh, you know, a gorilla or a dog, you don't see those same curves. You know, and that's evolved over time for us being upright. But what you do see is relatively stable, and this is gonna be a running theme, by the way. If you don't remember anything else, you gotta remember this part. The axial skeleton was built for stability, okay? The appendicular skeleton, the arms and the legs and all, are built for mobility. And that's going to be really, really important. So Shirley Sarman out of Wash U, she's a physical therapist and she's a head of biomechanics there, has this idea of relative extensibility. And anybody who's done any engineering or even put together uh, you know, a garden gate, can you tell me which one of these springs is going to be harder to stretch? Perfect, okay, the top one. So if it's a bigger, thicker, stiffer spring, it's going to take more effort to move, right? So this is gonna be something that comes into play too as we start talking about stretching and mobility because what are you all doing right now? How many hours will you be sitting today? How many hours will you be stretching and moving? Yeah, <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> it will be longer than that. Um, <laughs> but but you got, you know, if you think about this and you're sitting there and while you're doing this, and we'll go through some of the anatomy and other, you know, how to, how to undo some of this, your hamstrings are sitting there tightening up, right? Your hip flexors are sitting there tightening up. They're all in shortened positions and you're fighting gravity whether you realize it or not right now. So we're all slowly going like this, right? Unless we fight it. Um, and then we do that and then we go out and try to move and walk and climb stairs and, you know, play golf or whatever. And lo and behold, something will give way. So we'll talk about this. This is another important concept when we get to the stretching and what we're stretching later as well. So again, stability, mobility, consider the axial skeleton is really the foundation upon which muscles move the arms and the legs. If you look at the muscular system, you've got, uh, you know, look at the thighs, right? That's essentially all bone and muscle. I mean, there's some arteries and skin and, you know, nerves and stuff running through there, but proportionately compared to here, you know, these muscles are out here, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in between, right? And you look at the thickness of the thigh, the thickness of the arm, that's all muscle that's built to move you and the bones that allow it, okay? So some of the questions are, uh, what can you do to mitigate you know, disease process or at least help with function? And the things you can start doing immediately today, okay? We'll, and we'll go through and break these down, but sleeping positions, uh, considering a firm bed and a smallish or a pillow, particularly depending upon what position you sleep in, um, Posture, right? Okay, usually people sit up when I say posture. Okay, but this really right here is kind of like the real estate, you know, location, location, location. It's really posture, posture, posture. Then we've got activity, but when, what you're doing all day, every day, if, if you, you know, you're sitting here, right? You're taking notes, you're looking at your phone, you're live tweeting, right? No? Um, but then you get in the car and then you go wash dishes and you cook dinner and you write, and you're on a keyboard, and then you sit and watch TV, right? And everything's kind of sitting here in front of you, and we, and we get in these static positions all the time, and really want to avoid the static positions, avoid the static postures as much as possible, as feasible, maintain flexibility, avoid smoking, which I'm, I don't know if you mentioned that earlier, but that's a whole nother issue with accessory breathing muscles versus diaphragm that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but that's just a, a bad idea for us, okay? And then, Ongoing, the thing, the only thing that's different here, right, is ongoing active exercise. And nobody likes to exercise, okay, so um, we'll figure out a way to do that, but I, I love this quote from Zig Ziglar that they say motiv motivation doesn't last, well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it every day. Um, 
it's kind of like exercise, right? You've got to find the motivation each day. You've got to do something to get yourself going. And we'll, we'll you know, touch on that too. But ultimately, it's something that it's really more of a lifestyle change and habit change. And of course, this is where PTs fall completely flat because nobody wants to change the way they live and what they do. Um, everybody wants surgery or a quick fix or a pill. And that's part of human nature, um, particularly in our culture now. It's, you know, it's only exacerbated. But another premise here that's really important, I think, in, in going forth and out there is you don't brush your teeth for 45 minutes on Saturday, right? And think that everything's cool, right? You do it a couple times every day, two or three minutes at a time. You're consistent with it over time. And lo and behold, your, your teeth are all right, right? And hopefully floss more than once a month. But you can't expect to go you know, I've been sitting around all week and I'm going to go out and, and go, f you know, for a hike for an hour and a half on Saturday or Sunday and be like, okay, I got my exercise in. It's got to be incremental stuff all along the way. And if you do that, you know, and, and we can talk, I'm sure when we get to questions and stuff about what you can tolerate, and that's going to be different for everybody. And really the balancing act that we're all trying to figure out is how much can you do, what can you do within the constraints to not flare up, you know, the joints and not exacerbate the symptoms because we all know what that feels like. Um, but the idea of improved function without exercise is about as realistic as either of these. <laughs> okay, drugs are great. They're awesome, right? They help us kind of keep things in, in balance so that we can then do the functional stuff. But if we don't do the exercise, if we don't provide the stimulus for what, to which our body will adapt, then you, you can take all the stuff in the world. I mean, even you know, even anabolic steroids don't work if you don't lift weights, okay? You can take the drug, but if you don't do anything to then stimulate, it heightens this, the response to the stimulus, right? It doesn't actually create muscle. So you still have to do the stuff. Uh, and again, where the PTs become totally unpopular with everybody. Okay, so sleeping positions. This is going to vary for everybody a little bit, particularly around, you know, your current position and state, right? If I try lying on my back on a, on a hardwood floor right now, it's like, oh, <laughs> it takes a while. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're in a position where you're a little bit more fused and your T-spine's a little bit more forward, then you're going to need a thicker pillow just to be in, in a position like this, just, you know, because you don't want to be here and then hike back and, and not breathing and what have you. So, but the running theme through all this is the spine's as straight as your body will allow. Okay, so whether you're sideline, you want a straight back. If you're, you know, some people are a little bit hippier and skinnier in the middle, that's where a little, you know, towel or pillow underneath the waistline for some folks works. For others, we don't need it, right? Um, the whole point of a pillow between the knees, by the way, I think are, uh, at least people I talk to seem to be quite confused about it. It's simply to prevent you from twisting and rotating. Okay, because if you lie on your side, particularly someone maybe a little bit larger or, or wider hips and they let their knees fall together, then it pulls and then you start twisting and then you sleep like that. Um, the whole point is to get the spine back to a more neutral position. Um, so, and on your back, the, you know, again, back to that hip flexor piece that we'll go into, I'll actually show you what they look like and all, but that sitting position, um, those muscles, they're gonna be a little bit tight. If I lie flat on my back for any length of time, my left thigh starts to go numb. Okay, that's muscle tightness, I know it. I try to do stuff about it. Um, you know, again, none of us love to exercise or do this stuff. Um, okay, and then sitting posture. How many of you work at a desk, at least part of the time? Okay, so sitting posture, which, which of these is better? Well, yeah, I mean, you already know. It's the one on the right because it's super hard to find a real live person on the internet who's actually sitting in the right position. <laughs> So, um, you know, this is fine for a few minutes if you have the flexibility to get there, right? But it's not, it's not where you want to be for hours at a time, okay? And really what you're trying to do with this is you're trying to get the spine back in to a normal position, normal alignment. You're trying to keep the head over the, over the spine because you've got the... Think about this for a second. If my head's forward, the muscles back here are trying to hold me up and prevent it from falling on my chest, right? Because I'm on a stack of blocks. I mean, go back to thinking about that, that spine. If without muscles to hold that in place, you're basically just a stack of blocks. So if I move outside the center of gravity, I'm now working to keep it from collapsing. 
and you know we can go into your head weighs about 10 percent of body weight you think about a, you know if you held a bowling ball here balanced would you last longer than if you held it out here you know how, how soon before your wrist gave in so if you're doing that all the time coming back into a, even even incremental changes really reduce the forces and the compressive forces on the spine um, so your workstation setup if you're and we all work on computers at least to some extent now um, set yourself up first okay so get a chair that fits a good chair is just like a shoe it's not the same chair for everybody okay and if it doesn't fit you it can be the coolest chair in the world and it still won't fit you all right so um, we really ran into this in San Francisco with the dot-com bust which is probably going to repeat itself um, at least to some extent. But back in the early 2000s, all these Herman Miller chairs were on the market because, you know, Quokka shut down, all these places shut down, and they were selling them for 10% of what they cost, and everybody else wanted them. And then you'd go in and see somebody, and I've got this really cool chair, and they looked like a little kid because they have a large, they didn't know they came in sizes, right? And they come in three different sizes, and they're adjustable on top of that. So they want you to adjust the large chair to a 105 pound, you know, woman. And it just, it's like, that ain't going to work. Um, so, you know, making sure that you test out and you, and you find a decent chair, particularly if you spend any time in it, making sure there's contact in the back, that knees and hips are around 90 degrees, maybe knees slightly lower than the, than the hips, that you can be upright here, and that then, 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 you adjust the workstation around you, okay? Because again, you can have the coolest setup in the world. It can look really awesome. And if, I don't know if you've been to any of the startups, but if you walk through Facebook or you walk through these places, it looks really cool or it can look really cool. And then everybody's sitting like this on a laptop. You know, and they're just lucky that they're all young at the moment. Because um, they're getting away with it, you know, for a while. But the monitor getting up, uh, basically the monitor height, a rule of thumb is to keep it higher so you can't see the top of the monitor. Okay, the screen, the top of the screen should be at or just above eye level. And then that puts the rest of the screen in your field of view. Okay, it's close enough basically so that you can touch it or that you can see it clearly and, and use the controls. You know, we got bigger screens now, you can zoom in, you can, you know, if you catch yourself starting to do this or creep in over time, sit up, readjust, adjust what's on the screen so you can see it because the visual thing is often overlooked. And I know um, Dr. Lee's gonna be talking about some of that, but probably not from an ergonomic perspective later. So, but, but really, you know, that's gonna affect your posture. If you can't see it, you tend to compensate and do something so you can. Um, how many of you work on laptops? Okay, of those who work on laptops, how many of you have a laptop holder and a wireless keyboard and mouse? Okay, we'll get there in one second, but ultimately, you get to choose, right? So this is an area where free will is in total effect within your bounds, within your limits, okay? You gotta sit up and, uh, and we'll get to that. I'll show you what a, la a laptop holder looks like. But if you're on there all the time, it's a great convenience and they're lightweight and you travel with them and it, you know, I'm finding myself working on it too much now. But, but again, thinking about separating, but this is, a, this is a big, big deal because if you set up and you're sitting like this for five hours or six hours or God forbid longer um, in a day, you know, you're, that's a problem. So here's a laptop holder. I particularly like this type of design because it keeps you from reaching over to the keyboard on the laptop, okay? And you can use it, doubles as a document holder, okay? Um, and then get a wireless keyboard and mouse. You can get these for like 25, 30 bucks now. They're super cheap. Laptop holders are a little bit more depending. I mean, this is a super fancy, you know, this is the Porsche of laptop holders. Um, you don't need that one. You just need something to get the screen up. So again, that this is around eye level. And if you need to put it up on books or something, that's cool too. And then you can take it with you when you're on the airplane and all that's great. But for day-to-day -day work, you want the screen up in front of you. You wanna separate the keyboard from, from the screen. Okay, because nobody can maintain decent posture with the screen and the keyboard locked into each other. Okay, standing postures, also important. We all get, you know, I don't know. There are a couple of things that, that factor in. We tend to either hang out, you know, and not really be aware of it, or we overcorrect, and that's not right either. The whole idea is to kind of find that middle ground where you're comfortable. If you really want to test yourself without, find somebody you like and who trust, you trust. 
because um, if you overdo this, it can be irritating. But if you stand up, here, can we borrow somebody? Can I, do you want, you want to be my, on, no? Okay, come on up. Okay, so I'm gonna have you just stand facing that way for a second okay. and relax, okay? So I'm gonna put my hands on your head, okay? Okay, so if I push down, what just happened? Yeah. Here and neck and all, right? What if you straighten up a little bit here, tuck your butt just a little, okay? Okay, the trick is, that's not a parlor trick. Gravity's doing that all the time, okay? So if you're allowing yourself to just be a little bit too curved or a little bit too relaxed, gravity's trying to do that and you're fighting it the whole time. Whereas, again, it's a stack of blocks, right? That was a small correction for a pretty decent result, thanks. Um, but just being mindful that having someone do that for you to kind of figure out what that feels like, because almost guaranteed, you're gonna feel like you're doing this, you know? And, and basically, it's because your body gets used to what's, what, it gets used to where it normally is, not what's normal, okay? So if you're kind of allowing yourself to be a little bit off, you're gonna feel like that's upright or this is upright and really, you know, it, you're, you're gonna end up feeling kind of like you're exaggerating initially until you get used to that feeling. Um, and the same thing's true, you know, if you play golf, you, you get to choose where your back is in space. And it's appropriate that we're at the country club today, right? Um, and it might be interesting later if there are golfers to watch them over lunch and see what kinds of positions people get into. Um, and remember, your mom may have been right. Okay? <laughs> particularly with us, okay? Because if you're looking at a progressive you know, process where ligaments are calcifying and there's fusing going on and stuff, um, the position that you're in most, you know, eventually you're gonna get stuck there, or I'm gonna get stuck there. And you know, I, won't, I would much rather be stuck in a more upright position than, than hunch forward. And there's some uh, ways to help you get there as well. Um, so just remember, stay flexible, moving. What moves? not the spine so much. And here, so we're gonna go into what a stretch is and also a little bit of strengthening and why. So anybody get a wild idea or a guess at what a, what a stretch really is? Or the difference between a gross versus a isolated stretch? What's a stretch? It's really it's not, it's, of okay, lengthening a muscle. We're gonna make it even simpler. You anchor one in, you pull the other one away. Okay, because theoretically you can also, if you're, when I, if I squat down, my quads are lengthening, but under control. So that's a, it's called a, um, an eccentric contraction so that I don't collapse and fall. But um, you pull on one end, or one end, I anchor the other end. We'll go through anatomy of a couple different stretches, what they look like. And then if, you, if you're gonna write anything down, you stretch a muscle, two times for 30 seconds, okay? The research, what, we don't have great research because there's no drug company funding stretching research, um, but what we do have out there just keeps reinforcing this. You don't get, it changes a little bit. Up until, for older adults, it goes up to maybe 60 seconds. So, but between 30 and 60 seconds, two times each, once you get to that point, you have to get to eight hours before you see a difference. Okay, so stretching for two minutes or four minutes or 20 minutes or whatever doesn't have any additional benefit over the 30 to 60 seconds until you get to eight hours. And then there's an additional benefit. So I mean, the, the reason that plays in or where that comes in, if you think about night splints, people with plantar fasciitis or you know, Achilles issues, you put them in a splint overnight and position them, then you're getting a longer static stretch and it actually does pay off. But um, you know, there, isn't, there isn't a lot of great research anyway, so it's a little bit fuzzy, but that's, that's what we do know. Um, we'll call these good stretches, and what, what running theme do you see? Yeah, the spine, right? Relatively neutral. So they're stretching other, other things and keeping the trunk in a pretty neutral position, okay? What's the running theme here? Yeah, I mean, you're compromising at the, at the spine of the trunk somewhere. And this is the one, I mean, please don't do this. 
Okay, I know you'll be tempted. I'm gonna show you the anatomy and what you can do and get away with, but if you want to come see somebody like me, this, or really, if you do this and twist, that's the best and quickest way. Okay, you start going forward and twisting, because you've loaded up, you compressed, if you, you know, we can go through the force vector diagrams of why, how much compression force, and then you add a twist to it, it's just not, you know. Okay, this is the point at which you have to stand up, please. So just a quick break, just stand up. Literally, okay, because now we're gonna, really, honestly, please, if you can. Um, just for a minute to change position, okay? And the reason is we're gonna talk about creep, okay? And that doesn't mean the weird neighbor and whatever. Um, okay, go ahead and have a seat, sit back down. So, ligaments. And we, I know it's a little bit jumbled right now because there, there are a couple things to address. Intervertebral discs are not a disc. Okay, that's a misnomer. Um, there's no such thing as a slip disc. I know it's our colloquialism, but um, what you've really got here is ligamentous material. Okay, ligaments, is, ligaments are basically strapping material. They hold bone to bone. So they attach the, the bone to bone. They're made of fibrin, elastin, collagen. Um, not a lot of elastin in, the in these kind of ligaments. So they're not super stretchy. They give a little bit. But what you've got here, anybody dealt with hydraulic systems? It breaks in your car? Okay, does fluid compress? So we have a corroboration back there, right? Okay, so this is filled with the nucleus pulposus that you don't see. It's a, it's a jelly-like substance that is in the notochord during gestation and then it's sequestered and goes into your discs and your spine and your body doesn't really see it again um, ever if you're lucky. Uh, but you've got a jelly-filled center with strapping material around the outside. Okay, so what happens is when you try, when, when you load that with gravity, with weight, the fluid tries to escape, but it doesn't compress. Like a gas, you can squeeze down and compress. Fluid doesn't compress, so it's trying to escape. So what it does is it creates rigidity. I love this, it's not working. Um, rigidity here so that you stay upright. Now over the course of your lifetime, you know how we all get a little bit shorter. Part of that's the, the big joints, hips and knees, and a little bit of wear and tear on the, on the uh, articular cartilage. But a lot of it comes from the spine too, because remember we've got, <coughs> C1 through 7, T1 through 12, L1 through 5. So there's a lot of that when you get a, even a little bit of loss there, it compounds uh, relatively quickly. But if we have a jelly donut in essence here holding us together, think about if you put your coffee on top of it at Krispy Kreme and then push down a little bit and twist it. What's gonna happen? You got it. Yep, everybody knows it's gonna ooze out. That's what a herniated disc is. Okay, extrusion. So there are different grades of it, but you can do it to different extents. You can kind of irritate and stretch the ligament. You can tear the ligament. You can really overstretch it. You can completely tear it and have this stuff extrude out. I mean, there, there are kind of different things that can happen here, but the quickest, easiest way to do that is bend forward and twist, particularly if you're carrying something. Okay, but the other thing that um, is, is important for all of us to realize is if I do that and bend forward, how much do I weigh from here up? You know, it's about half my body weight. So my low back, if we're talking about that L5S1 and I'm bending forward and really reaching forward, I've got about 100 pounds. My center of gravity for my upper body is probably around here somewhere, right? 100 pounds, that far out, lever arm trying to compress that disc at L L5S1. And then if I add something to it, it's even worse. But I see people all the time, or used to see people all the time in clinic, who, well, I just bent down to get a shoe or a pen or a whatever, right? And I'll ask them, so if you pick up a 50-pound bag of dog food or rice or something, are you more careful with your mechanics? Well, sure I am. Okay, why? Well, because it weighs a whole, you know, exponentially more than the pen. And no, it doesn't. Right? For me, it's, if I pick up a 20 pound bag of rice and I'm more mindful, I just went from 100 to 120. Okay, so it's an incremental load as far as my back's concerned. Okay, so using good mechanics, and we'll touch on that, is really, really important. And then we're gonna get into why, um, why and when you twist. Your spine's not the same top to bottom. Okay, so remember we talked about the segment C5-6, cervical? So that's part of the neck, lower neck. They actually, these are the facet joints. The orientation is kind of like this, 
Okay, so it allows for rotation, allows for twisting. As I go up, they get flatter. Okay, as I go down into thoracic spine, they angle more and more. Okay, still allow for some twisting in the thoracic spine. This is the lumbar spine though. What do you notice here? Yeah, interlocking. The orientation of these facets change. And they change significantly. So they go from this kind of planar motion where I could rotate around to now interlocking this way. How much motion, how much twisting and rotation do you think is available here? Not, yeah, not a whole lot. Okay, so when you add up all five lumbar vertebrae, and this is also from Sarman's research, you get 13 degrees of rotation each direction. Okay, that, that's five at the bottom and two per segment above. If I do that, what happens to this? So if I go back and go home and do that exercise or ignore everything I said today and start doing those twisting things, once I get past 13 degrees from a lumbar spine, what's going on? What am I stretching? <laughs> that part, yeah, annulus fibrosis, the, the disc, what we call the disc, right? The ligaments, you're creating a shearing force between those two vertebral bodies, you're stretching that out, and then you're making this thing looser when it's actually probably the thing you want to be a little bit more stable and, and you're not, yeah, it's a static structure. You can't contract it and restore stability that way. You have to do it other ways. So if you're going to do all the twisting and loading, particularly loading and twisting together, over time you're going to irritate stuff. You're going to see more wear and tear. You get the wear and tear at the, at the zygopophyseal or facet joints. You get wear and tear at the intervertebral joints of the discs. And as we said, the nerves exit through here. The other you know, these are all nice, pretty pictures and stuff. Uh, Dr. Netter drew, drew some really cool stuff. The other, the other little dirty secret here is, though, there's no empty space. Okay, so if you, if you think about it for a moment, you've got the nerves exiting here, and you've got arteries, and you've got muscle, and you've got all these overlays. There's no open space. There's no place for them to really move around. So even though these look all pretty and pristine and open, it's all kind of a mess. So when you're, <laughs> that's a technical term. Um, so when, when you create inflammation and irritate um, in that space around, around the, the nerve root, it's a confined space. So you're getting swelling and irritation and inflammatory byproducts in a space that's creating basically an increase in pressure and a chemical irritant on top of whatever mechanical stuff you're doing. Okay, so please don't go home and twist. Please think, consider stretching and uh, remember to sit up straight, right? We'll revisit those. Um, but so exercises, strengthening, stretching, aerobic, and sports. The big disclaimer here is everybody's different, particularly this disease process. All of us are different. Our bodies react a bit differently. Um, this is not a substitute. These are some general guidelines. Please, please talk to a PT who knows what they're doing with this and can help you. And by PT, I mean physical therapist, okay? Because, uh, please, yeah, there's, okay, I won't say anything else. <laughs> the entry level education for a physical therapist at this stage of the game is a doctorate level degree. There's three years of postgraduate schooling with internships and residence, uh, residency for some of them. Um, and, uh, you know, if you've got somebody who knows a bit more about AS or even if they don't know a ton but they call me, I will kind of give them the quick down and dirty. For us, basically it's a framework. If they know what to do and what, how to kind of balance what they already know against this, they can do an awful lot. So they don't have to be a, a specialist per se, but they have, the, they have the foundation. And by the way, too, if I talk to them, I'll figure out really, really quickly whether they have a good enough foundation. Okay. Um, so if you go through some of the stretching, we're just gonna do a couple key muscle groups. These are the quads. Again, the anatomists are not super inventive. How many muscle bellies do you think the quadriceps have? You got it, see? So vastus lateralis, medialis, intermedius, and rectus, you don't need to know their names. Three of them come off the thigh bone, okay, off the femur. They don't cross the hip. One of them, the rectus femoris, crosses the hip joint, and then they all converge onto the kneecap and through the patellar tendon attach the tibia of the shin bone, okay? So if I anchor and keep the back still and then bend the knee, I am stretching the quads, okay? I like the prone position because it helps to stabilize and keep the back in place. And what you'll find is if you can't reach your foot, um, 
And please don't cheat. Again, remember, keep the one end still and then pull the other way. Use a belt or a towel. It will go a long way. You can hold it. Hold in whatever position. We'll talk about timeline before you see changes. But don't, don't let the hip raise up because if one hip raises up, now what's happened? Perfect, you're back to twisting, right? Probably in a lot safer position and you're not loaded, so you're probably not gonna do any horrible damage there, but you're not getting an effective stretch, okay? Hamstrings, actually they don't call them hamstrings, but um, it's three different muscles with four different muscle bellies. Biceps femoris, so biceps has two muscle bellies. Semimembranosis, semitendinosis, but they, they all attach, or the, the long head of the biceps and the other two, attach the base, the ischial tuberosity, so the sit bone, okay? If you'll put your hands underneath your bottom right now, and palms up, by the way. I love when pa patients do this. It's like, now I can't feel anything, right? <laughs> Fingers up. Feel that, and rock back and forth just a little bit. You feel that bone that you're on? Okay, that's the ischial tuberosity. It's the bottom of the pelvis, okay? That's where these bones insert or attach up underneath the glute, and they go down to the shin bone, the tibia. So this is an excellent hamstring stretch, isolating the hamstrings. Okay, on your back, the little towel is there just to preserve the curve so it's not completely flattened out. However far you can go with the, with the tibia, the shin, um, you know, straightening the knee, Straighter is not better. You go as far as you can go. You go until you hit resistance. That's the other misnomer, uh, misunderstanding about stretches. Different people, that the sensation of stretch is highly subjective. So feeling a more intense stretch, it's not necessarily better. You go to the point of resistance, you hold it. How long? Awesome. How many times? I love it. All right. So, and then you're going to see changes over time, okay? Do you notice the position of her ankle? Anybody tried this before and then, you know, you get a better stretch by doing the ankle? Anyone? Do you, does the hamstring go past the ankle? Gastric. Right, the gastrocnemius does, soleus, but you're not loading them up by doing this position. So why, if you get a more intense stretch in the back of the thigh by dorsiflexing, by moving the ankle, what do you think you're stretching? There's no muscle that crosses the hip, the knee, and the ankle. But there is something. Achilles tendon crosses the ankle, but I'm talking, is there anything that crosses the hip joint, the knee joint, and the ankle? Somebody knows it. No? Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yes. The oh, I got it. We have a ringer. <laughs> Right, so if you get in this position and you're feeling a more intense stretch, you're bringing the leg across or rotating or, or dorsiflexing the ankle, bring your toes toward your knee, and you get a more intense stretch, you're now stretching the sciatic nerve, okay? That's not going to pay off. The, the other thing is the nerves, nerves can stretch, they don't respond the same way, okay? If you do get there, and really you should probably be guided because the, the, the potential for flare-up of the nerve itself, if it's already irritated, is greater, much, much greater than irritating the muscle. But nerves are going to respond to oscillatory movement. They will get longer, although we have no human studies, obviously, where we actually took a nerve and tested it before and after. So, but, um, you know, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence. We see it, and we can uh, kind of go back and forth. You can do the muscle stretching until you catch up to the nerve. If you feel a more intense stretch when you dorsiflex, or you feel the stretch into your ankle, or into your calf, rather, when your ankle's in this position, you're probably putting tension on the nerve. You want to go back to backing off that and, and oscillating into it just to touch the, the sensation and everybody overdoes it when they first start, and then you've got to dial them back. But it's a, it's a totally different feeling, or you'll know if you overdid it, because the next day you'll feel you kick by a horse, and you'll call me and blame me. Um, so just, you know, stick with the muscle stretching. Um, hip flexors, this is the psoas, and this is the iliacus. They, the, the, you'll hear people refer to them as iliopsoas a lot, because they insert on a common tendon. And the tendon is down on the, it's the lesser trochanter of the femur, in, the inside of the femur, the thigh bone. Psoas comes off the front of the back, iliacus off the inside of the pelvis. They both think about muscles only pull. They both do this. Okay, they control lowering my leg. They're big muscles in soccer players because they're doing lots of kicking, right? Um, and these are big muscles. So sometimes people get into trying to stretch them and, and you have to think about them along the lines of the quads. They're, they're as big and heavy as the muscle bellies of the quads, and especially if they're well developed. Um, but if it's tight, it's going to limit how far you can move your hip back. 
you know, move your thigh back. So you'll see people sometimes running, kind of checking their movements. That, those are generally probably tight hip flexors. Again, back to the hip flexor stretch, his spine is really neutral. What we're doing here is anchoring the knee, okay, by putting it on the floor and then bending the other knee to rock forward to basically move this forward and, and extend the hip. And as you extend the hip, you put a little bit of tension on the muscle. Again, gentle, particularly because it attaches to the spine. If you overdo it, um, you can get into a bad position. What's wrong with this one? <laughs> Aside from she does yoga. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the problem is that now we're back to that, that idea I think I touched on, but I didn't, didn't delve into it, of a gross stretch versus isolating. So if you're trying to isolate the hip flexors, why is your knee bent? Because they don't cross the knee, okay? Why is her back arched? Because she's actually now shortening the hip flexor. If I'm bringing my spine closer to my femur, I'm not, I'm not doing that. So, um, you know, even though they, she's very proud of her position here, that's not a great... Not a great position, not a great stretch. Okay, so chest. We never have corners that are open in these rooms. Um, <coughs> so you're gonna have to go try it. Uh, chest stretch. Again, back to what we do all day, every day. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're here. We're slouched, we're on a computer, we're in the airplane, we're looking at our phones, we're driving, all this stuff over and over and over. And as we do that, we tend to close down and, and you know, put our pec muscles in a shortened position. And the pectoralis major and minor are, are right here on the chest. Um, what you can do is find a doorway, if it's narrow enough, or a corner. And it's real important, and you see it's not arching in the back. I don't love the foot position. I tried to find a better picture, but didn't have time to take one. Um, but basically, staggered stance, so that you can use your legs to control the stretch, and let your arms relax. And go to the point where you hit resistance, without overarching the back and forcing. And again, more harder, harder is not necessarily better. Just go hold 30 seconds, two times, and over time you'll see a difference. And this is where we need another volunteer. And I need the foam roller, please. Forgot to get it out of the back. Have you guys seen these? When we first started doing this, nobody knew what they were. Somebody saw one at the gym. Somebody had one at PT one time. Now they're for sale at Big Five and <clears throat> you know all over the place. And they're different when now there's blue and there's black and there's white and there's everything in between. Um, they're basically color coded for density. So the black one, this is a little bit different. Okay. So this isn't the super duper hard black one. Thank you. Um, there's another one that's like made of like the cooler styrofoam that's even harder. Um, but basically what you want to do we're gonna need a volunteer and we'll, we'll, now we'll do the par parlor trick. Okay, so what's your name? Ben. Ben, sturdy, sorry. I need you to lie down on the floor, please, on your back. And y'all can stand up, come watch. We're basically just gonna ask Ben what he's feeling. Okay, want legs out straight, arms at your side. Perfect, and normally I tell patients, you don't really have to run through this with me and tell me every detail, but would you please tell us, so everybody can kinda, here, where do you feel like you're in contact with the floor? Uh, my back of my head. Okay. Uh, upper back. Um, and then down. Head, upper back. We're skipping right. all the way down to the glutes. Yeah. <coughs> Tailbone. Yeah. How much are your thighs? Uh, not much. Okay. Calves and uh, heels. And Ben's a local. <laughs> the, co the, the calves. Um, do you say cervical? Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. Okay. All right. Um, so go ahead and, and sit up, and I'm going to ask you to watch me. So I want you all to remember that, and this is really great to do yourselves. Oh, we can have you stand up, actually. Sorry. Um, great to do yourself because you're going to do a before and after. And what I'm going to ask Ben to do next is, and, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you first real quick. And if this is too much, if you try it and it hurts, don't, don't do it this way. You can do it against the wall. Okay, because you're gonna mitigate the pressure and see. But what we're gonna do is have, um, have Ben get down, tailbone way at the end, otherwise his head's gonna be off the other end. <sighs> this is awesome after the airplane, by the way. Um, gonna lie flat again, and, and for the first part, just breathe, okay? 
And all we're letting, all we're doing is this is in contact with the spine and the, and the supporting the head and the pelvis, and you're letting gravity do the work. Okay, hands down at your sides, and then we're going to go side to side, and I'll help you. The trick here is you don't stick to the roller. Okay, you got to roll it out over the rib cage. And the other, and I'm not scooting and doing all this. I'm trying just to be as gentle and relaxed as I can and let gravity move me. And then what I'm going to ask you to do is roll off to the side and tell us again what you feel. Okay? Do you want to put a roller across your spine? You took your, your spinal, um, the interspinous processes across the... Uh... Starting, so the, the spinous process, spinous process... I don't know what the sound is. Um, the spinous process is the, the back part of the spine, the, each of those vertebrae that was sticking out in the back. Yeah, that's in contact, or at least some of them, <laughs> not all of them, are in contact when I'm on the roller initially, okay? We're gonna bend, go ahead and lie down, and I really want you to scoot all the way down, even more. Even more? Yep, okay, perfect. Right down. If you have a fusion or something, like a surgical fusion or rods and stuff, don't, don't do it this way. You need to have it modified. Um, and if it irritates you, please don't continue, stop, okay? Um, but right now, we're just gonna have him relax and breathe, and then we're actually gonna lapse a little bit into what I'm gonna show you in a minute. The diaphragmatic breathing, you notice when he just breathes, his chest rose up, right? That's not really how we're designed to breathe in a relaxed manner. Your diaphragm will go into that. What I want you to do, yeah, there you go. He's already on it. So, right, I wanna see, and we'll go and we'll show you why, but the belly's moving, not the rib cage. Okay, now go ahead and go side to side. Okay, not bad. Try to go a little bit farther, but really keep your hip up. Yeah, great. And this way, hip up. Perfect, okay, and just go side to side. And don't start letting your hips scoot and slide. Just let gravity do most of the work. And as you get more comfortable, better at it, you can relax more. Okay, and we're not gonna spend a long time. This is the other thing. If you're doing it and you've never done this before, don't do it very long. War is not better. You'll wake up really sore the next day. Um, go ahead and roll off to the side. Yep, just lower down and I'll lie flat on your back. Legs out again. And what's that feel like compared to before? Feels like pretty much most of my spine is in contact with the floor. Okay, so a lot more of the back's in contact. It's not, it's not really a parlor trick, okay? Basically, if you think about what we did with, with Chuck or Charles earlier, push down, you think about those curves. Okay, if I'm fighting against gravity all the time to try to straighten out, I'm working against my body weight and gravity and all of it. If I'm here and letting gravity assist me with that curve, particularly in the thoracic spine, and then mobilizing the ribs a little bit through my body weight and the, and the spine, and then I come off of it, I, I am now with gravity working a little bit better, okay? But part of the point there is too, before he got on the roller, Gravity's trying to flatten him out. But he's already so stiff that his neck's not in contact, his lumbar spine's not in contact. You know, he, he skips from upper back down to the tailbone, right? So if we can get a little bit more ability in the thoracic spine, it just simply feels like you're more spread out. Sometimes it feels like the floor has kind of enveloped you a little bit. Okay, go ahead and hop up, thank you. Big thanks to Ben, who got to lie down during the presentation. All right. But you can modify that, and particularly under advice or from, so with a therapist, you know, if you tend to flare up really easily, please don't start there. Start with a softer roller against the wall. You can start to feel some of the benefits. You, you know, basically, you're just simply trying to straighten up a little bit and then hold it. And that takes us into, okay, so the diaphragmatic breathing. I didn't understand the anatomy of this before I went to PT school. I had seen it, but I still didn't understand it. Um, this, this is the muscle in a relaxed position, okay? And the lungs sit up here on top of it. So, and, and it kind of seals off. So when the, when the diaphragm contracts, it basically flattens out. So the muscle contracts and it pulls down. So what happens to my lung volume? Yeah, it increases, okay? Because I've, I've pulled that muscle down, I've increased the lung volume. So, but what happens here? If I increase my lung volume, I've got, got stuff in here, right? That's the technical term. So, but I mean, you know, you've got your stomach, liver, intestines, everything below the diaphragm. And when you do flatten that out and increase the lung volume, it's got to go somewhere. 
And we're in a society where we look at all these magazines and pictures and actors and people who are like this all the time and think that we have to breathe up here all the time. Those are accessory breathing muscles. They're really important. They kick in you know, when you're sprinting and running and when you're anchoring your arms. And um, we'll skip that for now. But basically, when you breathe here, you're more relaxed. It actually has, there's a little bit of sympathetic nervous system response with it all too. Your rib cage can relax a little bit and ultimately uh, you can achieve a little bit better position and posture. The best way to practice that is lying down to start with. You can do it sitting. Standing is the hardest to learn, but it, um, with a little practice it'll come. Oh, make sure if you do this at home that you do set a timer because the first few times you do it, if you really start trying to do diaphragmatic breathing for five minutes, you may very well fall asleep and miss your next meeting. Okay. All right. Um, I, I always like to geek out on this, but I'll leave you alone. Um, so sarcomeres are simply muscle, muscle units. If you do remember back to biology and stuff, they're uh, actin, myosin, filaments, and the, the anatomy of a, of a contractile unit. The point here is, and to kind of skip through it real quick, is the contractile units, the little tiny pieces and stuff in here that, that make up a muscle cell are proteins. So when you think about stretching, you're not mechanically stretching the molecules beyond a certain point. You're providing a stimulus that your body is then going to respond to. And where strength training and stretching come into effect, they're very actually quite similar um, in their response time, about six to eight weeks. And the big part of that is when you do stretches, like those hamstring stretches over time, you, you will grow more contractile units in the muscle. You will eventually grow more muscle cells in series, end to end. When you lift weights, and everybody gets a little confused about that and doubtful and they don't think I'm telling the truth. When you lift, was that me? <laughs> Did I turn something off? Oh, look at that. Okay. So when you, do, when you lift weights, nobody seems to have an issue with you make the muscle bigger around, right? And what you're doing there is you're adding contractile units, you're adding your, your body's responding to the stimulus, the stress, it's adding more of the, of the muscle units, motor units, then it's adding more muscle cells and you grow a bigger around muscle. And so muscle cross-sectional area is actually proportionate to strength, all other things being equal, but you, you get a bigger muscle. With stretching, you do the same thing. It's just that you don't add them in parallel. You don't add them next to each other and make a bigger muscle. You grow a longer muscle. You add them end to end. Okay? And uh, the big take home here, too, though, is that happens after about six to eight weeks. You don't see physiologic change. So it's just like going to the gym. People who go in January and go in, you know, till the first week of February and quit because they didn't get any results. Yeah, you're, you're pretty much right. You know, first week or two, you're optimizing the neural system and you're getting a little bit, you're really not seeing muscle physiolog physiologic change and adaptation until you get into that two month window. Okay, so don't give up too early. Um, and with strengthening, generally higher rep, lower weights for particularly this population and people who are not used to doing a lot of uh, strength training. And the reason, a big reason is for for us is you don't want to irritate the joints and overload them too early. You want to stress the muscle a little bit, provide the stimulus while keeping the joints kind of under control. So um, this is a great complement to the chest stretch, right? Because now I'm stretching these out, but if I start strengthening the muscles that hold my shoulder blades back by doing kind of a rowing exercise or activity, I'm helping to maintain my posture and position. Um, for the abs, it works completely differently. Remember, we go back to the stability versus mobility. So my strength training, I'm doing lots of big movements, right? So everybody out there on the internet and otherwise teaches you to do these crunches and big movements. Is that how you use your abs? Do you see a lot of people walking around like, <laughs> Right? Okay. So... Even on the golf course, if you're watching a good golf swing, most of the rotation or a good, good percentage of it is coming from the hips, right, and the arms. There's some twisting, but, you know, really what you're doing is you're working on control here to transmit force from the ground through your body into whatever it is that, you know. Um, so anybody do martial arts or box in the past or any of that stuff? So the whole, the whole goal there, if you're trying to strike someone, is to transfer force from the ground into your opponent as, as efficiently as possible, right? Before you tire out and hopefully they 
tire out quicker. Um, but if, you're, if you are more solid here, think of a thicker, stronger spring, then you're a more efficient, you're mechanically more efficient in transferring that force. Okay, and that, the same thing holds true for throwing or for racket sports or batting or any of that kind of stuff. Um, you're going to be more efficient. The same thing holds true if you're vacuuming. Okay, if you have a weak spring here, then basically you're your own big shock absorber. And if you watch boxers or fighters that aren't really strong through the core and they move too much, they're not gonna last. They end up, they, they're too inefficient and they end up taking too much punishment. But this is a great way to start and there's a lot out there, but just be really, really attentive again to the pelvis. If your chest, the rib cage is still, you gotta monitor the pelvis to make sure it's not twisting around. You lift a leg. The whole point of lifting a leg is you're taking a weight that's trying to pull you out of position. You're simply trying to hold position. Okay, it's an isometric exercise. Everybody loves this one, right? That's the one we see in the magazines. Um, it attaches the front of the pelvis, the pubic symphysis, into the front of the ribs, and that's it. You've got three other pairs of abdominal muscles here that attach all along the rib cage, attach all along the pelvis, wrap around to the spine. They're really the ones that support you, that control you. And then what you'll see if you go to some trainers or to the internet or what have you, is a whole bunch of twisting motions because that's the only thing they know to do. You, what you want to do is hold still against a twisting moment, against something that's trying to pull you out of position because that's gonna not only help you with strength in the right way, but it's going to cue in how you use the muscle and help you train you know, to control and control posture and position when you're doing other stuff. Okay, so if you then go out and play tennis, you don't want to be doing a lot of, they, I mean, nobody ever tells you to twist your back more, right? They tell you to plant your foot and extend your hip, right? And then come through with your arm and keep the wrist solid, you know, those kinds of things. So with aerobic exercise, we know that it's, I mean, that there have been studies, it's safe, provided you don't have too much hip involvement, but there's a cheat for that too, right? If you, if you can't tolerate the bike or running or, you know, lots of walking or that type of thing, what can you do? How do you unload the hip and still get movement? Swim. Yeah, get in the pool. Perfect. So either swimming or water aerobics or, or any of those types of things where you can still get your heart rate going. Um, <clears throat> for, I basically want to minimize impact um, or, I mean, again, this is a little bit different for everybody. People, some people can tolerate more. Um, there's a guy in the San Jose support group who, he runs marathons. Now he's the only one I know. <laughs> But he's, you know, but he's, a, he's a relatively small guy. He's been doing it for years and years. He manages himself well, and he still wants to run. Okay, you know, you can get away with that perhaps, but it's probably not something to take up or to overdo um, initially at least. Uh, oh, sorry. So there are other guidelines, 60% of max heart rate. The, particularly if you ever had any issues, make sure you go to your doctor, you get tested, and there are ways to determine this for real under a stress test. The general rule of thumb, if you're otherwise healthy, is 220 minus your age is your theoretical, that's an important word, theoretical maximum heart rate. Okay, it doesn't mean it is, and, and if you've got other issues, make sure to get checked out and don't just go do this. But the point here is 60% of that theoretical max should get a change. And you monitor your heart rate, how? Now you, now you wear a little thing on your wrist, right? But if you wanna do it the old fashioned way, um, do your neck, the carotid artery here, and you go off the, off the Larynx Adams apple and kind of dive back and don't push, don't push too hard because you'll kind of squeeze it and you won't feel it, um, but kind of lightly and you'll feel your pulse. Okay, if you're doing activity, let's say you climb, climb the hill or go outside and walk for a little bit, then you do this, you, 10 seconds, okay, multiply by six and you've got your current heart rate. And the, re and the reason for 10 seconds is you keep going longer and longer, you start to move into recovery period because you, in essence, have to be still to feel your heart rate, right? So, but you can get an idea. They recommend 20 minutes exercise. It's all over the place. We, they've shown that three minutes of activity for people who are sedentary starts to help. So, you know, back to the point of do something. You know, if your knees and hips can hold up, then don't take the escalator at the airport, you know? Take the stairs. Um, if you can walk at whatever pace, walk. You know, do whatever you can. Um, cycling, stationary spin's okay. Stationary spin in the early stages with no resistance is absolutely fine, okay? Because what's happening there is you're actually getting the joints to adapt and the cartilage to, to not regenerate, but to start to toughen up a little bit. You're helping with the health of the joint, and I won't go into that too much, but you can contact me later 
But then as the joints feel a little bit better and are moving, then you can start adding resistance and work on muscle and aerobic capacity and all that. And then swimming is, of course, the, a great one. And pick something you love, okay? Because, you know, so some people don't like swimming, right? <laughs> but, so if you don't like it, you know, if you don't like being in the pool for 20 minutes going back and forth, then don't do that. You don't subject yourself to it. Go to the pool and use some resistive stuff and move around, if that's what your body can take, right? Um, but figure out something that you enjoy doing that your body can, ha can tolerate. And then, because consistency, again, is so much more important than how, how hard and how fast you can get started. Um, you know, and there's so, there's so many other things that you can be doing, too. I, I, I can't resist leaving that one in. Um, that's my buddy, Ag. That's his car. I taught him how to drive fast, um, literally. I was his first instructor, and then he, on the autocross, and he was my first instructor on the track, if that makes sense. And he won the, he was one of the Toyo Cup winners a couple years ago for this. But, um, you know, auto racing still, you gotta be in decent condition, you gotta work on strength, you work on your car, you move around, you're doing a lot. Um, you know, some things you have to kind of decide whether they're worth it or not. Um, I played soccer for 20 years. I was in pain sometimes. Sometimes I couldn't stand up. I still you know, put a ball in front of me and I'm an idiot. Um, so I just like lose my brain and have to go play. But, um, but do, do think about it. Do be judicious about what you're doing. And, and, and you know, if you love rugby, that's great, but you're probably not still gonna be playing at 46, okay? Just you know, think about what you can get away with and what your body will tolerate. And then there's some things that you probably should avoid. Yeah, I mean, what's the payoff, right? So you know, I try to think about this stuff with risk reward and what am I actually gonna stick with? And uh, you know, I'm doing much more baseball now because uh, my kids are doing it, so. Um, but then, you know, this is the last thing to kind of leave you with a, a thought. All the how-tos, all the breakdown of the different body parts and the where to, what floors and stuff, they don't really matter if you don't have a real reason or purpose to stick with it. So think about what your why or your purpose is. Why do you want to stay healthy? Why do you want to keep moving? You know, and uh, whatever it is for you, that's mine. I know, they got a little bit older, but I still like the picture. Um, but, uh, you know, you, that, that is a big motivation for me. I want, I want my, you know, I want to play baseball with my kids. And the older one, he started, or she, actually, she likes to do art. We've tried every sport. I mean, think, her mom's a PT too, right? Two physical therapists were like, you can play soccer? She played soccer for a few years until she was doing her hair and talking to the little girls and came off the field one day and like, do you want to keep playing? Not really. Why do you play? Because you want me to. I'm like, okay, you don't have to do that. Yeah, yeah, we've done swimming, we've done everything and tried dance and she's an excellent painter. <laughs> and we walk and she runs some. Um, yeah, but not competitive at all. And meanwhile, this one, oh my God. But, uh, so, but he's, got, he's nine years old now, it's starting to look like real baseball, you know, and, uh, and it's kinda, kinda fun. Um, but whatever it is for you, whatever you need to do to kinda get motivated, remember that's gonna get you out of bed at six in the morning to fly to Burbank, um, you know, to make it work. Uh, figure that out, and then, and then whatever it is, try to stick with it, and if it isn't working for you, figure something else out because there's lots and lots of variety and there, nobody has the monopoly on it. And remember, everybody's gonna give you the advice to do basically what they did. Okay, so you can hear people, but definitely filter it and think about it. What I did may not be the right thing for you. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Can you stay for a few question and answers? Uh, sure, Again, I don't know what time it is, but. It's, it's, um, <laughs> We're on time, and now we're going to fall behind a few minutes. So a couple questions and answers. Yeah, please. Um, in light of your advice about not twisting the spine, what would you have to say about yoga and maybe less so Pilates or Tai Chi? Okay. Well, if, I, if you'll indulge me, I'll answer kind of backwards, right? If you actually look at, at Tai Chi, there's, there's not a whole lot of twisting in the spine. 
you know, it's a lot of movement and kind of rhythmic and stuff. I can't do Tai Chi. I lived in China. I lived right where China, where Tai Chi was invented. And when they tried to teach us, I just kept going back to this is, I'm punching somebody's nose in and I'm, you know, I'm tripping them and knocking. I'm just like, that's not meditative for me, right? I, when I do that, I actually want to, so it just didn't work. Um, but, but it's a great exercise for balance. It's good for strength. Um, there's been an interest in the research around balance and falls, and that's another thing we didn't touch on, but that's a huge issue um, in older adults, particularly, and you know the, and the ramifications are much, much more severe as you get older too. So um, you know another exercise I think is just generally a good one. If you can do it, start at a counter, two hands, and just start balancing, you know, balancing in place, because we don't do enough of it, but if you think about what you're doing when you walk, Walking is basically a series of one leg stances, right? And then we don't go try to practice it. And if that, you know, there are times when that irritates me to no end, it flares up my SI or my hip or something, but the other times when I can do that and really work on it, and that's kind of your stealth exercise too. You know, you can do that in the grocery store. Um, Pilates with a good instructor can be great. Again, all the, the two, two big things. All the principles of Pilates are essentially what I just told you. Stability and mobility, okay? The problem with Pilates is it was designed for dancers. So the stability mobility thing is probably here when we're here. Okay, so um, apply these things and work within your, within your limits. And I think, you know, you can, it's not a, it's not a bad routine at all. Um, if you, I, I prefer the mat stuff. I, our whole clinics are set up so that we don't have a lot of equipment because my, my position is if I can't send you home with it, then why, why am I teaching you? you know, and and if, you were in, if you're at a gym or you have a gym and you want me to go there, we'll go there and I'll help you learn that stuff. But getting you to learn a whole bunch of stuff in my facility that you're not going to use in six weeks doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, so, you know, if you want to be signed up for a reformer class and do that forevermore, that's great. But I really like the mat classes and stuff that you can also do at home some of the time or if you're traveling or, you know, all those other, other times. Um, yoga, my issue with yoga is that it, some of the people are like, they're like, and forgive me, they're not going to ask me back after this comment. Um, <laughs> they're like evangelists, they're converts. They think they have found the promised land. And then you must also do it. And you know what? Maybe. Um, I think, you know, and that's, a, that's an over, gross over, oversimplification, but maybe, we have you know? A, a yoga instructor here. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said it any differently. But, but with a good, so here, and, and this, and she shouldn't have said this, because now this is the next part of what I was going to say, and now it's going to look like I'm pandering. Um, with a good yoga instructor who is respectful of your limits and your body, and you apply this stuff with your position, and you can't, you know, look, I'm not going to do the backwards headstand with my neck in that position because that's just probably not a good idea for me. They will be wonderful, and they will modify things for you, and they will teach you. And um, it, it's only the people, and this, but the same thing holds true for personal trainers and others. If they're trying to force you into something that you're telling them, you know, you know your body, right? Look, I don't. I don't allow my patients to say I can't, okay? That's the one thing they can't say. They can call me names, they can do whatever, but they can't say I can't. We have to figure out how can I. But there's some things that are just not smart or the risk outweighs the reward. And if you have someone who's respectful of that, I think there's a lot of good stuff. You know, there, there are a ton of great poses that are perfectly acceptable. Um, there's some other stuff that gets a little bit dicey, you know? But at the same time, there, there's some great, what was it? Y'all know who Stan Conti is? Come on, down here you ought to know who Stan Conti is. Stan Conti is a trader. No, he, uh, he was the head trainer for the Giants, and uh, he got their injury days down from 600 something to 200, and they wouldn't pay him enough, so he went to the Dodgers. And uh, <laughs> that's okay, Stan, Stan's a friend of mine. I've told him that to his face too. But, um, but anyway, he, uh, he did, and he came in and he talked. Uh, he was a PT when I was in PT school, he, uh, he came in and talked to us, and his first, first thing he came out of the block saying was, every exercise is a good exercise, every exercise is a bad exercise. What are you doing it for? Why are you doing it and with whom? 
And if you really look at that and answer those questions, there's, there's a ton of stuff out there. I can generally say don't do that. There are people for whom, you know, if you're a professional golfer, we're gonna figure out a way to make you twist safely, right? But for what's the, what's the payoff for this group? You know, the risks just way outweigh the rewards. So probably a long answer to your question. Yeah. I have a few questions. One is about the chair. How, mm -hmm. What do you think about those inflatable dolls that they have So the question is a gym ball on a frame. Um, why the frame? No, literally. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm a, right. Right. It, but it, it adds. Exactly. But the point of the gym ball is to not have stability. So, so I mean, the, the idea of using, you know, that, that was all the, in, the, all these things kind of cycle through, right? Using a Swiss gym ball for sitting for a while, I think, is actually a great idea. Um, but for 10, 15, 20 minutes a day, right? Not all day. Because, because the whole point of it is to challenge your stability, right? But if you're going to be there for hours at a time, do I really, do I need that? Or do I want to be supported because I need to continue to work and do all the other things? Um, no, I think it's a great exercise. There are all kinds of modifications, things you can do to, to challenge yourself more. Um, I'm not a big fan of them as, a, as an office chair because when you're sitting there for a long period of time, and really, we, you know, we all get really engrossed in what we're doing. Um, when you lose that attentiveness or attention to what you're needing to do to maintain the stability, yeah, I just, there, it's, it's riskier. So, yeah. Um, what do you think of the, the sit-stand desks that mm -hmm. kind of are the range? It, would that be beneficial for people with AS So asking about sit-stand workstations, I think they're great. Um, but again, they're kind of now, so my wife does ergonomics at Val's, and now everybody wants a standing workstation. Um, you know, and it, again, these things swing. And for the right person, for some, you know, if you have issues with tolerating sitting, and now we, you know, there's more and more research about how bad sitting is for us. Um, changing positions is great. Do you need a sit-stand workstation to change positions? You know, my day, I'm going into meetings, and I'm on the phone. We've, we've resorted to half my meetings are walking meetings now. You know, my, my office is right across from, it's, uh, you all know Fort Mason, the marina, the marina Safeway in San Francisco, you can see Alcatraz. So we do a walking meeting, walk outside, and I got Alcatraz and the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's, I mean, that's awesome, right? So um, that's motivation to get out and not sit in a conference room. So, you know, and we're doing that. If we're not having to write something down, and, and the other day, not in that part of town, another part of town, we did a walking meeting over in the Castro and then went back and wrote notes and stuff. So, um, you know, but we were out for 15, 20 minutes moving. And if you can get away with that and do it, if you're on the phone and you can stand up in your office and, and move, um, you know, without getting short of breath and stuff. Or I can't go outside on the phone in San Francisco because the wind's blowing so much. But, um, but anything you can do to change positions I think is great. If you're in a, in a you know, a, a, a job where you're not doing a lot of interactive type of stuff all the time, then, um, yeah, if that's the only way you can kind of get your stuff done and, and change, I think it's a great alternative. I, but I, again, I wouldn't go necessarily one direction or the other. I would want the adjustable, you know, and Ikea is now making them. So you don't have to spend $3,000 with the, because the other thing is do you, in this population, do you really want a hand crank that you're going to go up and down four times a day? You know, that's probably not the best decision, right? But with the electric motors, they get far more expensive, but now Ikea is doing one that can change, and it's, it's a lot better, a lot more affordable anyway. Yeah? Um, my son was diagnosed uh, at 12, and he's 14. Wow. the worst posture to a video game. <laughs> and of course, I tell him every time I see him, sit up, sit up. But any thoughts on? On changing a 14-year-old's behavior? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, here, here, outside my pay grade. Um, uh, if, he'll, if he'll be game, one trick I use for people, because, I mean, this is a constant issue, right? We don't know what position we're in. And a lot of people tell me, I, I, I love this one, right? You have a patient come in, and I'm a, I'm a PT. I've been a physical therapist for 15, wait, oh, Lord, for 19 years. Um, so they're walking in, and before they even we sit down and start, you know, doing the interview and the eval and stuff, I've already watched you move. 
watch you in the waiting area, I watch you walk in, I watch you at the front desk, I watch you come in, I watch you sit, put your stuff down, right? And you tell me, oh, I never, I, I use great mechanics, I have great posture. I'm like, no, you don't. I just saw you in, the, you know, in your natural environment like this and like that. And then, you know, no, no, you don't. But, but so many of them are completely unaware, right? So now they, now they know I'm watching them and suddenly it improves, right? But when they're not thinking about it, not conscious of it, it's, uh, you know, it's a lot harder to, to reinforce or to get there. What I'll do um, is tape people's lumbar spine, okay? And, and that's, uh, you know, use athletic tape. That'll tear off real quickly, but I have another version that can last for like three days um, without, if you're not allergic to adhesive and all that stuff, but where they have to relearn how to bend. Because the other thing people do all the time and, um, is when we go into a squat or a bend or sitting down is we initiate with the low back. And they're, com again, completely unaware. And uh, you're, you're meant to move, again, if we go back to that big ball and socket joint with the big muscles around it, how about bend at the hip, right? And the hip joint, not hips colloquially, but the hip joints where the femur inserts on the pelvis, right? So if I bend there and initiate my hips and knees and do a proper squat to sit down and to stand up each time, lo and behold, most, a lot of back pain you know, really starts to subside and go away. And, and people, you know, but again, they're not aware of it. They sit down, boom or they land or whatever. But that tape provides that immediate tug and feedback and they'll come back and they'll be muscle sore because they're suddenly using their low back more, but, Since but completely unaware. So the volleyball players learned it, they actually saw a lot of scars. But, uh, like yeah, make sure it's that not, you're absolutely some right. The, some. Right, the kinesio tape, yeah. I, I like the, um, brown. I'm gonna, yes, the brown tape. Use cover roll on the skin and then use um, the, um, oh my goodness, I'm blanking, uh, on top. It's, uh, you think I know, I've been using it for 20 years, right? Um, no. But uh, basically it doesn't, it doesn't really stretch or deform, so it's giving that tug every time. That'll last on, a, on somebody for about three days, but you gotta make sure they're not allergic to adhesives. Um, you gotta inspect the skin afterward because you can, when they're removing it to you, teach them how to do that because when if they rip it off, it's so strong that it can take skin with it. So you don't, I mean, um, that's probably best done under the advice of a professional or with them doing it the first time to make sure it works. But the, the cool thing about that is once you've done it for a couple times, you're, you've retrained, your, you started to retrain your habits. So as long as you're still attentive to it, you don't have to keep doing that forever. So would you suggest I take him to a PT? You gotta get his buy-in first, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, you do, right? It's something we actually teach to, uh, so we have residents come through and we have students, we have volunteers, and that's the, the one thing I take them aside and teach them because it's completely missing from PT school. I think the re medical residents start to get it later, like in their residency program and stuff, because, um, because nothing, they have these great ideas and patients look at them like they're, like they're daft, right? And uh, they can't figure out why won't they listen to my wisdom? Well, you got to get buy-in. You have to get agreement. And if you if you skip that part of things, then you know it doesn't matter how good you are, they won't they won't do it. Yes, ma'am. Got a question asked from our live stream audience. Sure. Um, so via Twitter, Winner Creative wants to know: My rheumatologist told me that PT doesn't help because the joints are always inflamed. So when should you do PT and why? I, the right therapist will be able to work with you at any stage, okay? Because, um, they, again, kind of like what we just talked about, they'll be respectful of, number one, they'll know what a flare-up is. Number two, they'll be respectful of you and the situation you're in now. And the right one, the, a, a good one, ought to be able to start telling you how to get that, to, to kind of undo that process. And we have doctors all the time telling patients, well, don't go in because you're irritated and you're acute and you're inflamed. Um, and I'm not talking about AS, I'm talking about like for all kinds of things. Like, oh my God, I would love to see them now. Because if I can get them out of that cycle quicker and teach them, you know, some of these things we were just talking about, like with posture and movement to stop irritating and, and aggravating it, then they get out of the pain cycle quicker, then we can initiate the other stuff quicker. And, uh, you know, but the problem with that is not everybody does it that way. You know, and when you have one loose cannon that kind of taints it forever, forever more for that rheumatologist, it's kind of, sure. Thank you. I may ask for you guys to come to the mic to ask a question so our live stream audience can hear it as well. Oh, I think we're. I'm gonna ask you not to come to the mic and ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> because it's time for lunch. <laughs> 
So we're going to meet back in this room at uh, 1.30. Thank you. Thank you.